Welcome to Classic Valley Investors. My name is Mariusz Konieczny, and today we are doing a real uh, bear, bear thesis for the oil tankers. So this is not a joke like I did before. And to help me with that, I have Dale uh, Hassel. Dale Hazel. Uh, Hazel. Dale Hassel. Thank you very much, Dale, for joining me. Um, can you just take a few moments and maybe um, tell us a little bit about who you are and and things like that? All right. Well, uh, I've been work. I've worked in the oil sector for 20, 25 plus years. So I've worked for Halliburton, Schlumberger, uh, Conoco, Phillips, and uh, I worked in uh, software. So I didn't actually go out in rigs and stuff like that. But so dealt, dealt with the oil industry. Also worked a uh, little bit on. Uh, so I did engineering software. So my background is in uh, engineering physics. So uh, I did a whole bunch of stuff with hydraulics, fracking, whatever, and uh, also worked on uh, my last job was with uh, one of my last jobs was with uh, Schlumberger, and we worked on uh, NPV. So that kind of helps you understand the mining industry because everything's based upon net present value. So I'm I'm right now in, invested and uh, interested in engine en, anything ener, energy related. So anything oil and gas, uh, renewable, whatever. I have my own beliefs on it. For instance, right, I believe uh, wind 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 farms are basically uh, a bird cemetery. <laughs> Uh, they're unreliable and uh, whatever else. Now, I also believe the ESG movement is is real and uh, impactful, but I also believe that it is uh, has a false narrative to it. Uh, it's it's as if uh, carbon dioxide is the most dangerous gas in the world, and you, all other pollution doesn't matter. You know, sulfur monoxide, carbon monoxide, irrelevant. Just look at how much CO2 is being emitted, and everyone's everyone's scared of CO2, which is a harmless gas that basically promotes plant life. So uh, that's my that, those are kind of my beliefs, and I also believe, like in terms of investing, right? Is uh, I don't believe investing in things which don't make money. I was reading, like, you know, about uh, J.C. Penney and uh, Valaris, and everyone's buying all these bankrupt companies, and it just makes absolutely no sense. So when a company goes bankrupt, well, the shareholder gets wiped out. So why are these people investing in this crap? And uh, I was reading, like, recently uh, uh, the the projected uh, uh, the uh, the projected price of Tesla is now infinity. Because every day it goes up by like 100 or 200, right? It's price to earnings ratios, what is it, like 500,000 or something? These companies just, the, the valuations of these companies just make absolutely no sense whatsoever. And I don't touch them, right? I, I just touch what I believe I, I have like knowledge in. It's like Buffett says you should invest in what you understand. Uh, not just, don't, don't just go up what an analyst says, right? I, I believe like analysts are like uh, people who can't do their own trading, so they become analysts. And, you know, like uh, brokers are there to make you broke. <laughs> because like, you know, if you look at the last financial crisis, all these brokers were selling everyone subprime loans and stuff like that, right? It's, uh, you have to look at the incentive, right? As they say, if you tell me the incentive, I'll tell you the result. And so, those are kind of my beliefs, and uh, I believe like uh, being a contrarian. I believe investors are like herd animals; they all jump on something. So, when Bitcoin's going up by 100% a day, well, everyone's buying Bitcoin, right? So, all these investors jump on board, right? Even though it's up by 200% already, and they're buying even more of it. I was reading like uh, when Bitcoin was going up like 700, 800%, people were mortgaging their house to take out loans to buy more Bitcoin. And then it drops like, you know, 60% or something like that overnight. It just makes no sense to me, right? So I want to be in sectors that people are not necessarily jumping on board on. So 
my biggest investments in uranium because uh, I believe the ESG movement will force people to go to cleaner energy sources. And there's nothing cleaner, in my opinion, than nuclear. So I'm, I'm, I'm mostly invested in, uh, in, in uh, uranium. It's also been in a bear cycle for 10 years. And my philosophy is uh, low prices are the cure for low prices, and high prices are the cure for low, high prices. So when you have a low price, then everyone restricts supply and whatnot, right? So then the price has to eventually go up and, and vice versa. If the price is high, people will come up with substitutes and drive the price down. For instance, when OPEC had the prices up in, uh, in the hundreds uh, back in the 80s or whatever, that, uh, that event caused, the, uh, caused people to go to um, biofuels. So right now we have a huge corn lobby, which all wants uh, corn biofuels and stuff like that, right? So, uh, so I don't believe like OPEC, for instance, wants a hundred dollar price of oil because it'll just encourage the switch over to renewables and uh, away from fossil fuels. So I think the sweet spot for OPEC, for instance, is in the fifty to sixty dollar uh, USD range. But that's my opinion. So uh, I don't know if you have any questions or anything. Okay. So, um, all right. So that's a nice introduction to you. And so let's get on the oil tanker bear thesis. Um, all right. Let's. Can, can you take some some time to describe it? All right. So in 2020, the rates were really high. Uh, there were rates were high in uh, 2019 with the Costco sanctions. So what we have going forward is that uh, the oceanic tankers, which have been taken out of the market in 2020, will re-enter the market at some point. So that's uh, 54 plus tankers, which are just going to go into the market. Uh, also, uh, the net fleet growth for crude tankers is estimated uh, 3.7% in 2020 and 2% in 2021. Now we can dispute those numbers and I, I'm, I'm going to go over the scrapping stuff uh, in, a, in a minute, but it's still fleet growth. And now we have to discuss uh, the coronavirus, of course, which is impacting demand. So the in your previous video, you were saying, oh, well, there's going to be a vaccine in three months or whatever. I would go on the other side of it and say, there won't be a vaccine in three months. And I'd even go further and say, I doubt there's even going to ever be a vaccine. So I'm, I, I, that's my personal belief. Now, some people will think uh, uh, I'm wrong on that, but uh, in history, the fastest vaccine that was ever created was for mumps, and that took four years to create. Uh, the first, uh, and uh, the problem with uh, all coronaviruses is it mutates. So there used to be a single strain of coronavirus, uh, the COVID-19, in Wuhan. But now that's deviated and mutated into multiple versions of it. So to create a vaccine that covers all different versions of COVID-19 is going to be virtually uh, very hard to go going forward. So I don't believe there's ever going to be a, uh, a vaccine for it. The, now, they, they've said that the, the earliest they can come with a vaccine is sometime in 2021. And uh, because you have to do a lot of testing, right? You just can't just inject somebody with a, with, a, with a virus and hope that they're cured. So there's, uh, there's stage one testing, stage two testing, stage three testing, et cetera. And the earliest uh, that they could would be. Uh, they're, they're fast tracking, of course, would be sometime in, say, March or so, would be the absolute earliest that it could have a vaccine. And it's probably the earliest is really uh, more likely in uh, 18 months from the first case, so sometime in July or August. So I, I don't believe there's going to be a vaccine. I don't know what's good. Like right here, I have the TSA, right? So uh, you can see that uh, the uh, uh the, the numbers of uh, travelers dropped all the way uh, under three digits, right? So uh, under 100,000. 
and in uh, 2019, they're over 2 million. Now, if you look at the, the most recent numbers, they've obviously climbed. But week on week, uh, it's actually declined here. So uh, this 7, uh, 7, 8 to 7.15 is no, actually... No, no, hold, on, hold on a second. What is this? What is this? this is the uh, uh, TSA checkpoints. So this is U.S. travelers. Uh, is this just air or all travelers? This is air, airline. Oh, okay. Uh, 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 whatever it is, the Homeland Security, everyone traveling through the air. So... Uh, so it, it's gone from 632,000 to 589 uh, week on week. So it, it has been increasing week on week until, until recently. And I believe that's because of all these uh, uh, new, new lockdowns, like in California and, uh, and whatnot. So, and everywhere I've, I, I, I look out right, I see that uh, there's 14-day quarantines on everyone and... Uh, and all these new restrictions and masks in place and everything else. And uh, the question is, when will there ever be a, a conference to go to? When will there ever be a, uh, a an NBA game to attend, right? Right now they're playing in a bubble in, in Florida. <laughs> Nobody's attending the games, right? Uh, the stadiums are empty. All the concession stands are empty. Nobody has a job, right? Well, like a lot of people don't have jobs anymore. So the unemployment rate's astronomical. And I just, uh, so my personal belief is that the death rate will go down because they'll come up with better solutions, right? Hydroxychloroquine and, and uh, uh, the Gilead medicine and, and combination of the two and whatnot, right? So I don't believe you can you can uh, you can heal the uh, uh, COVID-19. I believe it's like a common flu, which will return every single year. Uh, they're also talking about whether you can get even herd immunity to it, uh, because they're saying that you'll probably recatch it in a in a few, you know, you can recatch the disease the virus, right? But uh, so. I believe that they'll they'll come up with uh, better and better uh, healing. So the the time in hospital will be reduced. And uh, the the one thing I have is that all these numbers are kind of it's hard to hard to understand the numbers too, right? Uh, the mainstream media is, is I, I hate the mainstream media. Let's just say that because if it bleeds, it leads. So it's all like you know. Fear mongering, right? It's like every every single article is like uh, climate change. We're going to die in 12 years. Uh, coronavirus is going to kill everyone, right? And everyone has to stay at home. Uh, no socializing, no nothing, you know. And it's like uh, it's just massive fear mongering. And uh, frankly, uh, I believe people have to live, right? So. Uh, the, here's a recent article that uh, I was reading uh, is that uh, uh, I also believe in the stupidity of government, right? So 600 physicians say that uh, lockdowns are a mass casualty incident. And what they're talking about is all these lockdowns are causing uh, 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 suicides to increase. So suicide hotlines are up by uh, – up sixfold, right? Like 600 times, 600 percent increase of, in uh, hotlines, and uh, there's also uh, all the businesses that are failing, right? The longer you keep this lock, these lockdowns in place, right? The more people that go bankrupt, and the government can't just keep on spending. For instance, uh, Canada spent 300 and some odd billion dollars on this coronavirus. The U.S. has spent uh, several trillion. And the thing is, right, you're just propping up the economy because nobody has any jobs, right? So if you if you pull away uh, this uh, spending, well, what's going to happen, right, is that, the, you know, you're going to have a huge recession. So the question is, how much can the government keep on spending to keep this uh, keep this pseudo economy going? 
and oil is based upon uh, the economic growth, right? So if your economy is in a massive recession, you're going to use less oil. So this is the bear case, right, is that oil demand is is permanently impacted or uh, significantly impacted for a continued uh, duration. So you have the oceanic tankers coming back into the market. You have a fleet growth, and you have reduced demand. So all that weighs on uh, the tanker rates going forward. So, uh, and those are the, the the main things, right? And you can look at uh, also the scrapping rate. Uh, the scrap metal, uh, the scrap iron is based upon general economic activity. So when, uh, uh, so when uh, you have huge economic activity, uh, scrap iron rates go up. Therefore, it, it the the rate at which you get for scrapping it or demolition of your your vessel improves, so you get better rate. So right now, scrap metal rates are extremely low, and so one can expect uh, less incentive to scrap. Uh, also, the the price of oil is pretty cheap now, so therefore, uh, therefore the uh, which is beneficial to the tankers, uh, so that their costs of uh, operations lower. But uh, with all these cuts of production, you're going to have an increase in the uh, in the cost of oil, uh, which should increase the price, which should increase the cost of operating a tanker, which should make it less economical. So right now you can get away with the lower uh, tanker rate, but yet make a profit because the, the the oil rates are so low. But if oil price goes up to the fifty to sixty dollar range in in let's say three or five or six months, then your uh, your operating costs go up for the tanker as well. Uh, that's pretty much it then we can go through uh the scrapping rates and stuff like that if you want now or or if you have any questions or disagreement or comments yeah let's go through some scrap scrapping rates like you said okay so i was uh so uh, this is a great website here uh and so uh so i was re reading what the tanker scrap uh, ages are so uh in 2020 33 years of average scrapping age uh, then it was 30, uh, 30, 30 years in uh, 2019 and 27, 18 in uh, 2018. So the average age is 20, 28-ish, right? So you hear all these people say, okay, your, your, your vessels are over 20 years old. Well, it's, you know, if I look at the 30s, right, and say, okay, well, the vessel's 20, 20 years old and you don't scrap till age 30. So... <laughs> Uh, it needs 10 more years before it's uh, scrap worthy, for instance, right? But, uh, but I, but I did a little bit more thorough digging in this, right? So, uh, there's just different, uh, different, uh, different vessel types. So, MRs have a longer life expectancy compared to a larger tanker. So, the larger the tanker is, uh, the earlier it scraps. So VLCCs will scrap at an earlier age than an MR, for instance, right? What what ages the, would the uh, VLCCs scrap? All right, uh, right here. Uh, so uh, there. All right, here we go. Dem demolition age is for a VLCC. So you can see 20 years across here, right? So you can see it scrapping at like 18 here and 18 here, and then you can see it scrapping like 20, 23 and a half, 23 and a half or whatever, and 24 here. So it's uh, between the ages of 24 and 18 that it scrapped historically. Now the question is, is the history the same as the future? And I would contend that 
uh, in 2020 plus, the scrapping age is probably a little lower because of IMO 2020. Uh, because uh, the newer vessels can use the uh, the uh, higher sulfur fuel compared to the older vessels. So uh, because they they have the scrubbers on and whatnot, right? So uh, uh, so uh, now now you can look at the the ages of the ships here. So like there's just different um, so the Aframaxes have a 20.5 average age. Uh, the MRs are 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 closer to 25, 25 plus or so. And I think the what skews this number to such a large number is probably it's counting all these uh, mini tanks and uh, product tankers here, and that's probably what which which is bumping it up to the 30 range. So I believe that the MRs are in the um, in the 25 to 30 range, and uh, the VLCs these these are in the 18 to 18 to 24 range. Uh, the Suez, uh, the Aframax, well, uh, actually uh, I may, may have been wrong. There's maybe it's this. Let me check here. Uh, uh, it's the uh, the Suez Max is, is 20.5. Uh, so the, the Aframax is a little smaller, so it'll be a little bit uh, higher age. So so uh -huh. from what, the way I understand it, it appears to me that the crude tankers would tend to have a shorter lifespan than than the product tankers. Am, am, am exactly. I right? Yeah. And then so yeah. uh, I'm sure you, I'd like you to comment on this. I'm sure you've listened to uh, Robert Bugby talking about the product tankers, how when they reach 15 years of age, they tend to uh, leave the premium trade. So, so he didn't say that they get scrapped, but they they leave the premium trade. Do, do you yeah, agree with the, Do you it, agree with this statement? Yeah, because uh, uh, after 15 years, like every article I've ever read, agrees with that statement, uh, because the uh, the the coatings on the tank tank uh, become damaged. So that they can't, can no longer carry uh, the the premium products. They can carry the the lesser products. So they they become less economical compared to a newer uh, MR. Right. So if if on the if on the crude side, let's say that you know a quarter a quarter of VLCCs are 15 years or older, then then out of that quarter, uh, obviously not all of them. Would get scrapped because not all of them, you know, are close to the 50, uh, 20 years of age. But maybe the ones that are, you know, at that age would be more of candidates for scrapping. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, I think also it depends on what rates you're getting and stuff like that. Also, it depends on what uh, the demolition rate is and uh, secondhand rate and everything else. That all goes into determining uh, what you're going to do with your tanker. Yeah, and then so, and then the the cost of the survey too for for individual yeah, exactly. vessels, obviously. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And uh, also depends on when the survey is, right? Like you're you're probably not going to just uh, scrap it mid before surveys do, right? So right, you're going to try to squeeze as much survey. as you can out of it before yeah. before yeah. the bill comes due. The only exception would be is if if you're getting a rate that's below break even. Right. If 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 hypothetically, I'm going to offer you something that's below your break even on your on your VLCC, and it's due for uh, due for a survey in say six months, I'm one could consider scrapping it uh, before the survey. I would assume. Yeah. So so it appears to me that like on the product side, if if the statement of the premium trade and 15 years of age is true it appears for like a company like Scorpio or maybe some other product tankers that have maybe newer fleets um, for the premium fleet to be uh, you know reduced scrapping doesn't necessarily have to happen it, they just have to pass that certain age and the fleet gets reduced without scrapping yeah, well, just for that, well, right? What happened here is 
from my my understanding, right, is that uh, uh, Scorpio will get a premium on all their ships compared to an older uh, somebody with an older MR, for instance, right? Right, right. Because obviously they should get a premium for being uh, younger, and also because they're more they're more efficient because they're younger, so they're more fuel efficient. They also have a cheaper cost of operation. So a younger fleet is cheaper to operate as well. Yeah, okay. And uh, so I was going through this, right? And, and uh, the VLCCs look like, you know, they're, 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 they're not uh, growing too much, right? But uh, Suez Maxes look like they are growing in fleet size. So uh, if we go down to, to the Suez Maxes down here, uh, so you can see that uh, they've ordered 16 more Suez Maxes this year alone, and that was uh, that's been that's uh, this from, from May, and we already know the TNPs ordered at least three more uh, Suez Maxes, so we know at least 19 were ordered this year alone, and so uh, this uh, Suez Maxes uh, I'd be a little concerned with because of all the uh, of all the uh, all the new ones coming into the market, and so uh, I would think that so I don't think that the VLCCs are really going to grow, uh, but the Suez Maxes look like uh, they also have a higher um, higher uh, order book, and if you look at the age profile on these, like uh, uh, let me let me increase this so it's more uh, easier to see, so. Uh, the 25 to 30s is right here, and uh, there's only seven and 43 here. So you have uh, uh, you have uh, 81 Suez Max is coming in the next few years, and you only have uh, only have set 50 50 here. So that's uh, 31 extra coming uh, coming into the system in the next next year or so. And that's not including the three more that was ordered by TNP. So I would be a little bit concerned about uh, the growth of the, the Suez Maxes, for instance, right? Not as concerned about VLCCs growing in, in uh, total, but the Suez Maxes look like they are uh, the, the, they have some headwinds in terms of uh, fleet growth. Uh, after Maxes look like they're growing as well, but not 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 as bad as the uh, Suez Maxes, so the uh, 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 it's a, it has a 9.2 percent order book, book versus the Suez Maxes. So this article is like uh, is a few months old. So uh, been virtually no scrapping and uh, and there's been uh, some new orders, right? So. Uh, but if you look at the the fleet age here, there's uh, uh, so you can see uh, here that they have uh, a bunch here uh, that are so 55 are coming due uh, uh, the 20 year cycle is coming due in in a, within the year right and whatnot right so uh, after maxes are, are so here's the 25 years so we have 12 over 25 years 44 so we have 76 orders in the next uh, that are coming coming in the next few years, and we have 56 in this in this here. So there's there's a slight growth here as well, which which contributes to the uh, uh, to the to the uh, analyst report, which says uh, I think it was uh, 3.4 and uh, 2.0 or whatever it was uh, fleet growth in in crew tankers. Now. The product tankers, on the other hand, uh, I see a huge growth in MRs, more more so than anything else. Uh, and MRs have been uh, have been very poor uh, rates recently. So these targeters are very smart people. So when uh, when LR rates were high and MR rates were low, they just took uh, for for long haul, right? They just took the MR. And uh, took a couple of MRs and loaded the LRs onto them because the MR was cheaper. Same thing which happens in uh, with the the crew carriers, right? If this 
if the uh, if the uh, the rates of uh, VLCCs is really high, they'll just put uh, they'll just split it on to multiple Suez maxes and whatnot if the based upon rates. And so and also if if uh, VLCC rates are are very high. Then they'll take us uh, even an LR and make it into dirty trade and vice versa. And the one thing I learned that is is a VLCC can actually act as a as a clean product tanker. Uh, so when it's newly delivered VLCC before it's been uh, corrupted with uh, the, with dirty oil, it can carry uh, carry products in its first voyage, for instance, which is. Uh, which I learned just recently. So uh, if we go to MRs, which have had pretty anemic rates, so Aframaxes have pre- had pretty anemic rates recently, and uh, and MRs have had are having uh, not so great rates right now. You can see that they've they have uh, a pretty high uh, uh, new orders. Uh, so for MRs, there's 172 here. Just this is 172. And if we look at uh, the uh, the ages, so uh, so before, so you can see that these are really high numbers here, and these numbers are really low numbers, right? 22, 32, 27, 17, 13, and we know that these guys uh, scrap later than the other ones. So uh, I see that MRs are going to grow. And so that's going to uh, affect the, the rates on MRs, in in my opinion. So uh, the LRs are not 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 so bad, but I think the MRs and like the Suez Maxes and maybe Afro Maxes are are growing in fleet size. Uh, so that, that's pretty much uh, the the main uh, the main uh, theses of the the bear cases and. Uh, you know, low, low oil demand, uh, fleet growth during low oil demand. So every year for the last 10 years, uh, oil consumption has increased, right? So everyone went into 2020 and uh, they assumed that uh, oil, oil consumption was going to continue to grow. And, of course, uh, COVID-19 happens and... So demand is uh, demand is not, and the the bear case is also that these guys like to order tankers. <laughs> we already know TNP ordered three three new Suez Maxes, so <laughs> just recently. So uh, you know, uh, even 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 uh, even in 2020, uh, uh, do we have uh, the order book for? Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, the cargo miles have gone up for for these things. But uh, if you're not hauling anything, uh, uh, if you're not hauling anything because there's a uh, lack of demand, uh, doesn't matter if your cargo mileage was up earlier, it will obviously go down. So that that's basically the the main uh, bear case. Okay, so just to summarize, what you're saying is uh, oil demand permanent, permanently. Um, well, I wouldn't say permanently. At least uh, the, even the OPEC uh, came out with uh, their forecast, I think, two or three days ago. And they said 2021 was going to be the largest uh, growth of of oil demand it's like it's going to go up by 7 million barrels per day okay so uh, so oil demand uh, over the last you know 20 years or so or more oil demand was always going up now oil demand is lower um, it's not i mean it's going to grow but it's it's not going to be at the same level that it was uh, we have e- even even if you say that there's fleet growth, it's still fleet growth. So we have yeah. we have fleet growth during the time of low oil demand. Uh, we're not going to have a vaccine, uh, and then the oil tanker CEOs are like little children, and they like to order new ships. So, I mean that's 
you know that's the bare case scenario that's pretty bleak uh, so people will probably be surprised to hear after you just laid out the bare thesis that you are actually bullish on tankers so uh, are you insane or <laughs> tell us why are you bullish in such okay. a case uh, so uh, let me finish that last statement with the seven million barrels million barrels per day uh, because 2020 was so bad on the consumption of oil is that the consumption of oil in uh, it, the 7 million doesn't get them back to pre-COVID-19 levels. Uh, but uh, so, so what, what do you mean by 7 million? 7 million what? Okay, 7 million barrels per day growth over 2020. Oh, okay. Uh, but still doesn't bring you back to the pre-COVID-19 because uh, it's more than 7 million uh, barrels per day decline in 2020. If that makes sense. Okay, yeah. Uh, so now, uh, what we are seeing, so on the on the on the bullish side, we are seeing uh, 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 here we go. Okay, so we're seeing a, a, a destocking. So this is global oil on water in million barrels per day, in, in million barrels. So we're almost almost back into uh, the normal range. So these are historical values. We've already seen it drop from uh, 13,000 uh, 13, to, uh, to almost 2,100. So within, within a month, we will have destocked to the normal levels already. We have, a, we're already in a, in a supply, in a, in a uh, su supply deficit. So the inventory is declining worldwide, and I don't think uh, I don't think it, anyone can deny that because you can see the oil and water is decreasing. Uh, you're going to see the congestion in uh, in China being alleviated and uh, demerge rates go down and whatnot, right? But uh, what's going to happen after the oil and water uh, is solved, then the actual onshore storage will, 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 will disappear as well. And uh, the one thing that uh, one has to know is that uh, prior to, uh, to IMO 2020 was this uh, ballast water treatment costs promote accelerated ship scrapping. So if we look at this allied thing, and we look at uh, the uh, the uh, the tanker scrappage, we can see that in 2018, 260 were scrapped. 2019 had better rates, and so the 170 and 143. Uh, uh, so when uh, when these guys had to put in these ballasts. Uh, they 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 scrapped a lot of these ships and uh, probably rates weren't high in 2020 in 2018, so they scrapped a whole bunch of ships. So I think uh, the reason why this the rates uh, spike up and have spiked up in 2020 is that they scrapped a lot of ships ahead of 2019 2020. Which means that the shipping market was probably tight going into the years. So, if you're already tight, even if you grow a little bit, you're just less tight. If assuming we get back to relative to the same levels, so you weren't necessarily oversupplied going in. Uh, but obviously, there's been more ships coming in than are being scrapped, and uh, so the the fleet size may may grow. Now, I th I think what will happen is that the owners of the ships are not idiots. <laughs> They're going to look at these uh, look at the demand, and uh, and also look at look at their, their the rates they're getting. And I think they'll scrap earlier than maybe people expect. Uh, I also think that these companies are trading at like 40% of NAV. 
So I look at a company like uh, TK Tankers could sell off all their ships and have more money than their total enterprise value. <laughs> it's like, uh, all right, just sell off all your ships, just buy back every single share, you know, and you, you know, raise the price of your shares, right? Because you can sell it, you can sell the ships for more than uh, uh, you get fair market value for your ships by selling it. Uh, and your your but your shares are undervalued by forty percent or whatever. So uh, you can easily buy your shares by selling ships, and that's what some uh, some people have suggested is that sell some ships secondhand and buy back your shares because you're you're buying you're buying your shares at forty percent discount and you're selling your ships at 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 uh, at par. So uh, so I just look at. Look at the the price uh, discount and uh, what not to like about a forty buying forty cents on the dollar. And I think uh, I think what'll happen is uh, we're in a supply deficit right now, so the demand is is over the supply, and I and you can see uh, protests in Serbia recently protesting lockdowns. And uh, Argentina is coming out of lockdown in, in on July third, uh, July seventeenth. Uh, oil, uh, so we know that uh, demand for air traffic is is kind of stagnating. Well, it was going up, but stagnating still, still at twenty eight percent of uh, pre uh, pre COVID levels of air traffic. So it's down seventy two percent. But we know that. They're opening up airports, uh, runways in Europe. Uh, I think uh, I was reading about Norway is uh, reopening some air traffic. Uh, they're doing air bridges and whatnot so that you don't have to have quarantine to travel between uh, the European nations. Like you can't keep this lockdown forever. And I, uh, my hope is that the government is not completely stupid. Which is hard to say because governments are really stupid normally, right? So you can never underestimate the stupidity of governments. But I'm hoping that governments have at least some rationale that they can't keep everyone locked down and stop concerts and conferences and everything forever. And uh, I, I, I'm hoping that you know the death rate comes down to a sufficient level that people are no longer afraid. So uh, the thing is, right, these lockdowns are devastating, like third world nations, right? People are starving to death because they, you know, uh, there's no there's no money, right? The government, like in Canada and the U.S., the government just throwing in, like, throwing in trillions of dollars to keep everyone at home and giving everyone a big paycheck to do nothing. Third world nations, they can't do that. They have to go back uh, to, to work. Even if they're going to die doing it, right? They have to get back to work because they're going to starve, and they're going to. The government just can't support them with two thousand dollars a month or whatever, right? Right. Well, someone s someone has to actually produce the things because they want us to stay at home, and at the same time consume everything that we want. And who exactly. who is going to provide that if everyone is at home? Right. So I'm I'm hoping that. These governments eventually do as Sweden does, and just let everyone just go out and be happy, be merry, and uh, you know the death rate will come down. Uh, better, better, uh, better uh, treatments and whatnot. And uh, so I, I just can't, I just can't foresee the, that they keep this, these lockdowns forever. And uh, like the the U.S. Canada border has been shut down for another month, right? It's been. Sh I, I never thought that their border between U.S. and Canada would ever be shut down, right? <laughs> Who would have thought that going into 2020 that they'd, sh you know, hard lock on the border? Uh, but uh, you know, you can never underestimate uh, government stupidity, though. Yeah. And yeah, go ahead. Okay, so uh, yeah, I mean, I think this was a nice summary that you presented in your bear uh, bear case. I mean, there is. Uh, 
I mean, people that watch my videos obviously know my view on things. I think that uh, the oil demand, I think, it will surprise. I do think we're either going to have some kind of vaccine or some kind of different solution. But I don't think it's important what I think. If you're listening to this, yeah. to this uh, video here, uh, I would like you to drop in the comment and and tell us, both of us, me and, and Dale, what is it that you think? What is it that you agree with me on? What is it that you agree with Dale on? And let's have, you know, civilized conversation about, um, you know, the, 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 the thesis. Uh, and yeah, so Dale, is there anything else that you would like to add before we conclude okay, this? Okay, yeah, I, I want to add a few more things that I, I didn't get around to. So I also believe that uh, the shale is gone. So uh, the shale has been losing money for, for the last decade. It's only been propped up by uh, by throwing money at it, right? Uh, so uh, a lot of the tanker, the, the bull case is uh, on uh, on uh, on uh, cargo miles. So. I don't believe the U.S. will be shipping out nearly as much oil as historically. Uh, they may may be importing oil, uh, and uh, so uh, here's a here's a and uh, the thing is uh, the U.S. demand uh, like uh, uh, so right here is a key statement from uh, from here right as demand normalizes large inventory overhang will be worked off faster than people realize and uh, for instance right here if if, if production were to average 80.5 million barrels per day global inventories would go from full to 15 year lows in only two months and that that's based upon uh, the demand being uh, 2019 demand minus 5 million barrels per day so uh, then basically if you averaged a uh, 15 million barrels per day deficit over two months, you'd go from uh, from full to a 15-year low. So uh, people don't necessarily realize that there is not as much inventory as people believe, and they don't believe I, – I believe it will it'll come down faster than people expect. And I also believe that – this will result in a surge in oil prices. So I believe. So I'm I'm long anything oil because I believe in Q4 and Q1 of 2021, for instance, right? Oil prices will be back up over over 50 because uh, there's several reasons which I believe this. Uh, I believe because shale oil is gone. So every incremental barrel of oil that uh, enters the market in the last 10 years, right? All, all new, almost all uh, new demand. So oil has been increasing in demand for the last 10 years. Almost all of that incremental demand has been met by shale oil, and shale oil went up to 13, uh, 13.1 million barrels per day, and the the rig count is now. Uh, is now well below sustaining levels for the current uh, current production levels. So even though the U.S. shut in a bunch of wells and then returned them back on to operation, the U.S. production is going down. Even though OPEC said in 2021 that they believed that U.S. oil production would increase, I don't I don't believe that because the decline curves on shale gas shale wells. Uh, is uh, is very large, so I believe the U.S. shale is 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 not going to come back to nearly to where it was ever, to where it was before, and I believe that uh, uh, what will happen here is uh, is also that uh, if you look at the companies that are going bankrupt, all the uh, all this all the uh, all the shale producers are going bankrupt. But also all the offshore oil companies are going bankrupt. So Valaris is in restructuring, Noble's in restructuring, Sea Drill's in restructuring. Every single one of these offshore oil drillers is is basically bankrupt. And 
because the 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 fleet size was too large and as a result of that uh 30% of world oil production is actually offshore and so offshore production is going to be declining in the next uh, next year or so because the oil fields are getting long in the tooth because there's been under investment in oil offshore because of all the production onshore uh, from the shale. And the other thing I wanted to, uh, to, to mention is uh, that uh, on the bull case here is that there's so many different blends and whatnot, right? Everyone thinks uh, just get the crude to a refinery, right? But you need to have the right crude at the right refinery, right? So uh, it's uh, the oil tanker play is a geopolitical play. So sanctions, uh, you know, uh, different uh, government policies and whatnot, which uh, which uh, alter trade routes, right? Uh, ban on China or whatever, and or or a war or something like that. So any of these things with, that alter trade routes uh, benefit the uh, the tankers, and and you just can't just uh, so you know, the different routes and stuff like that. So uh, it, it all plays into it, right? Because you have sweet oil and you have heavy oil and whatnot, right? So you need the right oil, the right tank thing, right? And you have to get it to the right refinery, right? So you just can't go from the, the shortest route to the shortest, to the nearest refinery, right? You need to get from the right oil from the right place to the right refinery, for instance, right. So, and then, so I have a question about the shale. If yep. if the shale is going to have a lower production, uh, wouldn't this mean that U.S. would have to import more oil uh, from somewhere else, which would mean more ton miles for the tankers? Well, it goes both ways. So right now, the uh, the U.S. is exporting oil uh to china so that's a pretty decent uh decent uh trade route so now if they if the uh if they become oh, hold, an import, on, hold on just let me just ask you something out of the out of the uh, production for shale um how much of that product shale production is actually consumed by the united states uh i'm not certain how much they 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 consume but I where, do where, know. Where, I'm, where I'm going with this and and you know maybe you can correct me or maybe someone can leave a comment is I mean as the United States we, we are uh, you know one of the biggest if not the biggest the second, con consumer uh, I think the second consumer I believe is China's number one US number two and India number three right so, so for for years and years we've been hearing before the fracking revolution how you know we were uh, dependent on the Middle East and this was a problem. So then we became this big, biggest producer uh, of crude. So, well, the problem for the, so problem for the U.S. Yeah, hold is, on, just, just let me finish. Okay. So we, we, we became the biggest producer. Uh, so, so where I'm going with this is if we are, you know, consuming some of the thing that we, we are uh, producing, then we're not exporting that much, right? And now, if we have to import a lot, w wouldn't the, wouldn't we have to import more than we export? Well, there there's imports and exports. So right now, the U.S. imports and exports currently. Mm -hmm. So uh, if we look at uh, the his history, right? Uh, a lot of these um, uh, the uh, refineries in the U.S were built many years ago. And they're built more on, uh, a lot of them are built on heavy oil. So there was a bunch of imports into the U.S. Uh, from Venezuela and from Canada because the, they have the heavy oil, that uh, the bitumen. Which is, which is exa exactly what you said, that uh, you have to get the right type of oil to these refineries. Right. So the problem is that the shale oil is all light. And there isn't enough, uh, there, the, so they export a lot of the shale because it's, it's light and the, the refineries like the heavies, a lot of the 
there's a lot of refineries that like light, but the most a lot of refineries like the heavy stuff, right, from Venezuela or from Canada. So they export a lot of the light oil to the other refineries. And so uh, it's the same thing with when you have sweet or or uh, sweet or uh, uh, non-sweet oils or sour oil, right? Uh, that's where you get the sulfur, right? And that's where, you know, you have the high sulfur versus low sulfur bunker oils come from because different blends have different uh, different concentration of sulfur. So uh, I expect that there will still be imports and exports from the U.S. It's all the, – the reason why the U.S. exports – is because the Brent price is higher than the uh, than the uh, the WTI, right? So if you're in the Gulf of Mexico, and you produce one barrel of oil, right? W would you rather sell it for forty three dollars or forty dollars? You're gonna export it. <laughs> I'd rather get uh, I'd rather get forty three dollars for my oil than uh, than forty dollars, right? Mm -hmm. The Brent is always at a premium to to WTI, right? So if you can get to port. And uh, depending on uh, – it all depends on the tanker rates, right? If the tanker rates are low, you export it. You need a certain differential between these two in order to justify exportation, right? If, if the tanker rates are, are say, like uh, are, are ex ab ab abnormally high, well, you'd rather export your Gulf of Mexico oil to your – to your local refinery than to export it to the to the rest of the world, right? Right. So it's it's the spread, and and that's the thing which the uh, tankers take advantage of is the spreads between these uh, things, right? So if the spread between any of these uh, different blends is large enough, right, uh, you you would export it to the refinery that need, that's going to pay a premium on your blend. Right? That makes sense. So, the, the, so it's 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 all it's a lot of it's regional, right? So it's not just uh, strictly how much oil is being produced, but all these other things. There's certain dynamics, right, involved, right? It's not just you know black and white. If if everything was black and white, then there would be no trade. Everyone would know that. It's going up or it's going down. You know, there, there has to be some deviation in people's beliefs. And the thing is, right? If you look at all these people, right? You got copy and whatnot, right? Everyone needs to do their own due diligence, right? It's like, don't believe me. Don't believe uh, what copy says or anyone says. Everyone who's telling you to buy this has already front run it. It's like I already own it, right? So go ahead, buy it. I want you to buy it and. Build up, build up, build up my stocks, right? It's my interest for you to buy this stuff, right? You know, and the people are sell, telling you to sell it, right? They've probably already got a short on it, right? And they want you to sell it. <laughs> Everyone has their own interest, right? If you if you give me the incentive, I'll I'll tell you the the result, right? If I'm incentivized to uh, uh, because I'm shorting it, right? I'm going to tell you to sell it, right? It's like my incentive is to get everyone to sell or get everyone to buy, right? So, you know. All these people are, you know, uh, bidding stuff, right? And here's an interesting one I, I got recently, right? So uh, recently they uh, did a shipment from Canada. So uh, they they shipped it from Alberta, which is here, right? So they produced uh, produced some oil here from Synovus. They shipped it to the West Coast. Then they tanked it all the way through to the Panama, all the way up here to get to the East Coast. So they went from Canada to Canada through a pipeline and then a tanker. If you, the thing is, right, in Canada, you can't build a pipeline east from west to east, right, because you got to go through Quebec. So the refinery is over here or whatever, right? So, uh, actually, it's here, St. John's, Newfoundland, right? So they, they shipped it. So you got all these uh, government policies that stopping, you know, pipelines and stuff like that. So – and you have this ESG movement that's just radical, right? And they don't want any pipeline, so it's it's less, I guess, less environmentally uh, bad to ship from Alberta to BC and then take a tanker all the way up there instead of just doing a pipeline across Canada. It's like the stupidity of governments, right? And it just uh, astounds me. And and like uh, Joe Biden with his 
two trillion dollar green energy plan. We're going to make everything electric vehicle. It's like the question with all these ESG guys, right? Is how are you going to make everything electrical, right?、Uh, are you going to are you going to build a you know two two billion uh, 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 renewable energy、uh, wind farms and solar farms? And if you did, it's so unreliable and And like in Germany, right? They built all this,、uh, all the renewable energy, right? And they actually sell energy at negative prices. They actually have to pay people to take their take their energy, just like oil. You have to pay people to take your oil. Back in April, right? With renewable energies, right? When you have the peak uh, peak uh, peak hours, you produce way too much, and you just have to pay other countries. Just here,、uh, we're flooding our grids, so take our oil, take our energy, right? So it's like、uh, all these stupid uh, government uh, initiatives and whatnot. And if you want to electrify your grid, like I'm just looking at、uh, all the resources required, right? Like I own like Rio Tinto, right? It's like it's pretty safe, right? You know, it's、uh, you know, it's like when you deal with all these energy, right? Like most of these miners are just、uh, are just milking the the shareholder, right? But you know. Uh, that's why I like you know the majors, right? Is that they're they're safe and、um, resources are are at a fraction of、uh, of the、uh, you know the price to earnings ratio on a lot of these resource companies are a fraction of what you're getting at price to earnings ratio on on saying the tax the tax are just enormous. I don't even touch them, <laughs> but that's just my beliefs. Okay, Dale.、Um... Let's let's wrap it up.、Uh, thank you、All、very、right. much for your time. And like I said before,、yeah, thank you for having me. If you yeah, if you're listening to this and、uh, you want to comment,、uh, agree, disagree, dispute, or if you want to be interviewed uh, uh, and present your case, just contact me. I'm not opposed to anything as long as your name is not George Noble. You can be <laughs> on the show. So、uh, yeah, Dale, thank you very much.、Right. Thank you very much. Yeah.